Today's Chronicle comes from Penn State University in State College, Pennsylvania, where I was on sabbatic leave in 2007 for six months. I was very fortunate to work with horticulturists Dr. Bill Lamont and Dr. Mike Orzelik and other fine folks there. My office was in the Tyson Building. It was just a short walk away from the Berkey Creamery, which serves just wonderful ice cream. Today's research project was conducted at the Plastic Culture Center at Rock Springs Horticulture Research Farm near State College, Pennsylvania. A rollout plastic tank was tested within this framed area. The wooden frame was used to guide a screed board, which was used to level the surface. The surface was rocky and needed cushioning for the tank. First, several layers of used plastic were laid down. Weed control fabric was then placed over the used plastic. Here's a close-up view. A 1.1 meter wide, black on one side, white on the other side, co-extruded 25 mil plastic film was rolled out. This, of course, is where we get the name Roll Out Plastic Tank. Roll out the plastic. We're going to have a garden of fun. Internal support will be needed to give this tank shape. Our answer was to use nursery trays and place them upside down in a row on the plastic film. If your imagination is pretty good, it would look something like this. Then an upright, narrower plastic tray was placed on top of the upside down trays. A tray with slitted 4.2 centimeter square cells was placed in the upper tray. Here's a schematic of the internal support of the tank. When the plastic film is folded over, this forms a 12 centimeter high oval shaped tank. Here you can see how the 6 centimeter tall upright flats and the 6 centimeter tall upside down nursery trays form the internal support. Here's a top view of the tank with the 12 centimeter high internal support. The trays were filled with growing medium, excepting for the cells where the transplants would be placed. Come to think of it, I'm not really sure why we placed all that growing medium in the cells that were not going to be used. Then the trays were covered with a 2 mil reflective aluminized mulch. This would help to conserve water and repel some insects. Since we're in the experiment business, it seemed reasonable to try several other methods. Here, 10 centimeter pots will be the growing containers. Again, aluminum foil mulch was placed over the trays. Aluminum beverage cans will also be used as growing containers. I hope to make a future video on aluminum beverage cans as containers for sub-irrigation hydroponics. Again, the reflective mulch was placed over these trays. Now let's talk about how to hold this tank together. For some reason, this particular roll of plastic had holes about 10 centimeters from each edge so let's use them. Drip irrigation tape was placed through the holes and used to hold the tank together. A knot was made on one end. And since it was difficult to make a knot on the other side, a short length of microtube was placed through the drip tape. Here's an action shot where Dr. Orslick is inserting the microtube. We're ready to plant in this rollout tank, so let's start with some fairy tale eggplants and Cherokee purple tomatoes, and King Arthur peppers. The eggplants, tomatoes, and peppers were transplanted into the rollout tank. Here's a close-up on the transplant day, which was July 13th. As you can see, the plants are pretty big. Fast forward to August 8th, and the eggplants are green and lush and are growing well. They continue to look healthy on August the 20th. On August 27th, I see some eggplant fruits forming. On September 4th, the eggplants are looking healthy. Despite the fact that the plants were looking pretty healthy, the yield was only 0 0.34 kilograms or 0.75 pounds per plant. It looks like the methodology needs to be improved somewhat to grow economic yields of eggplant. Let's see how the tomatoes grew. On August 8th, the tomatoes look great. By August 20th, the tomatoes are growing gangbusters. They're starting to camouflage the tank. By September 12th, the tomatoes are pretty big, and fruits have formed, although they're pretty well hidden by the foliage. 
By October 1st, the plants are still growing strong and the fruits are coloring up. The tomato yield was quite respectable at 4.9 kilograms or 10.8 pounds per plant. So the rollout plastic tanks look like a possibility for growing tomatoes. And finally, let's check out the peppers. Well, the peppers also look healthy on August 8th. They're continuing to grow nicely on August 20th. Look at the nice fruit formation on September 4th. On September 12th, we learned that peppers can grow in cans. By October 8th, some of the peppers are turning red. We grew the peppers in plastic trays, pots, and cans. Surprisingly, the highest yields were obtained from the cans, 0.84 kilograms or 1.85 pounds per plant, and the lowest yields were from the pots. Let's talk about the nutrient solution. The depth of the nutrient solution was 8 centimeters at transplanting time. The EC was 1.0 MS at transplanting time. Note that the nutrient solution level wet the bottoms of the seedlings in the upper tray. As the plants grow, the EC of the nutrient solution should gradually be increased to 2.0 MS. Notice that the nutrient solution has dropped below the upper tray. At this point, we need to be adding more nutrient solution, either manually or by a float valve. In actuality, the EC of the nutrient solution ranged from 0.7 to 1.7 MS in this trial. The goal is to aim for 1.0 MS at transplanting time and gradually raise to 2.0 MS during the growing season. To make our nutrient solution in this trial, we used stock solution A, which consisted of 25 pounds of ChemGrow 81536 plus 15 pounds of magnesium sulfate, and stock solution B, which consisted of 25 pounds of soluble grade calcium nitrate in 25 gallons of water. Our procedures for adding stock solutions and water in this experiment were quite cumbersome, so we're going to suggest a more efficient way by using a float valve similar to this, which would make it possible to maintain a 5 cm depth of nutrient solution after the drawdown from the initial 8 cm depth of nutrient solution. This float valve has an internal mechanism that shuts off the nutrient solution flow when the level rises to a certain preset point. The nutrient solution will exit from the side of the float valve. A fitting facilitates the connection to a drip irrigation tube, which extends the entire length of the tank, thus allowing uniform distribution of the nutrient solution. Premixed nutrient solution could be stored in a tank such as this, and then it would flow by gravity to the float valve, which would maintain the desired solution level, and then flow into the drip irrigation tubing, which would distribute it in the tank. Well, I can think of a couple of disadvantages to ground level rollout tanks, and they would be that bending labor is required and it's easy for slugs to crawl into the tanks. But the advantages of rollout tanks would include promote high quality plant production, fertilizer and water efficiency, no crop losses due to poor soil fertility, soil diseases, and nematodes. And the foliage doesn't contact moist soil, and this reduces foliage diseases. I would appreciate suggestions and comments on ways to improve the rollout tank concept. This will help those brave pioneers who try growing by this method. Roll out the plastic. We've had a garden of fun. Roll up the plastic. This video is done.